just to say a bit more about myself. So I've been involved in working on in the Middle East for the, about the last two decades. Initially on the Palestine-Israel conflict, but wider in the region, in part because of a recognition that to actually think about any kind of resolution to the Palestine-Israel conflict, it is embedded in the region and some of the key actors will have to be part of that. In fact, that took me on my travels to Iran um, and in fact for about a decade I was involved kind of working quietly behind the scenes on the Iranian nuclear issue um, and also worked on Syria, I've, I've worked, been in Saudi Arabia, but in fact recently I've moved um, to establishing a preventive diplomacy project called the OPSA process. And what that is essentially about is what you can do off the record, quietly behind the scenes, um, in areas of conflict. Now, this absolutely links to the ideas in my book, The Fog of Peace. Um, in paperback, it's also been called How to Prevent War, which um, is quite an audacious title. Yeah, because many people say you can't prevent war, but I think you can do much to mitigate it and much to be aware of tipping points and what can be done at those tipping points. And that's the kind of, that is the point of this um, preventive diplomacy initiative. Um, a kind of absolute, I have to say, passionate believer of what can be done quietly, off the record, early enough. Now, those in the Middle East will say it's a tough neighbourhood. Um, people only understand kind of muscle and the use of force. And you hear that again and again. But my take on it, and I don't think I'd be alone, is even the use of force, whilst it looks like a temporary victory, does actually no nothing to actually create the, the foundations or the preparation for any kind of sustained peace. And whilst there is some understanding to the notion of prevention, it's still marginal and add-on and not central to how we think. Now, I took the title in the first place, The Fog of Peace, because many of you will remember the documentary Fog of War, Robert McNamara. And in his wise old age, I think he was about 70, having been the architect of the Vietnamese War, he said, the problem was we didn't understand empathy. We didn't understand the mind of the enemy. And meanwhile, you had 3 million Vietnamese killed, 57,000 Americans. And he said, we realized we were fighting different wars. We were fighting the Cold War. They were fighting the War of Independence. And it just seems like we continue to repeat this. We see the world through our own lens, a Western lens. Inevitably, um, it's what human beings do. They see the world through what they know. And it's very hard to get the imagination to see the world from the other point of view. And one of the essential messages in this book is until we learn to do that better, we will continue to make a mess. Um, because we will not understand what's going on. And there are so many examples you, of our recent interventions where we might have even done it for good intention, but we've actually messed up because of our inability to get into the minds of the people we're working with. I mean, Iraq is an absolute case in point. Of we didn't understand the history, the context, what we were doing, what it would mean to go for debankification, to get rid of 300,000 uh, people in the whole kind of infrastructure, civil service, what would happen when you sent people off with their weapons, and how this would set the foundations for an insurgency. And again and again, it's like th those in positions, polit uh, uh, political decision makers, actually often operate in a hermetically sealed bubble, 
without any kind of understanding of context, of the mind of the enemy, how they're thinking, and what would end the conflict. Um, and often it's in a climate of crisis management. And that's one of the biggest tragedies about how we make decisions to go to war. Um, and one of the reasons, there are many, many reasons why the Middle East region is in such a mess, but certainly um, that is part of it. I, I co-authored the book with somebody called Gianni Pico, who some of you might recognise his name. He worked for the UN for 20 years and actually negotiated the end of the Iran-Iraq war and spent a lot of time working quietly behind the scenes, building up the relationships that allowed him, in the end, to have the right cast of characters. But on top of that, he actually said that you, yeah, he's an Italian, that you actually have to think outside <coughs> the box. And in fact, he couldn't get the Iraqis and the Iranians to actually come to a deal. And if you remember, um, Khomeini talked about drinking the poison chalice. What he did was to stop the flow of weapons and the money from the Saudis to the Iraqis so it dried up, um, so they couldn't continue fighting. And so he was a kind of example and inspiration about how to resolve conflict, you have to also think outside the box. And then, in fact, he was involved in the negotiations with Nasrallah in the early, in the 90s, the hostage, the hostage releases, people like John McCarthy, and he went, met with him quietly off the record, behind the scenes. And he, in the book he says, even when he was held blindfolded and bundled into the back of a car um, to go and meet with Nasrallah, he says, and he says in the book, I took his hand. This was the guy who was the hostage taker. And I, I asked him about his family and I realized however nasty what he did, underneath there was a human being. And I think that's really hard to remember when people do terrible things. Um, but that's a kind of underlying principle that actually the way we think about war is around geopolitics and power. And we, and we actually don't include the human aspect. And what we're saying is you need to include all. You cannot be naive about it and say it's just about the human face we but it is also but the, the, the geopolitics and the power doesn't really solve the problem or if it does it temporarily does so I think if I take some examples to try and make it alive and real maybe it will have more meaning so and my you know I would enjoy talking to everybody afterwards about this if we think about Gaza, since the Israelis left Gaza in I think 2005, there's been three rounds of war. Um, and it's reached the point where I think it would be fair to say that certainly in the Israeli military, they can no longer see the utility or benefits for any further rounds of war and that in fact it would be true to say that nobody has benefited and in fact there has been a huge amount of suffering on um, one has to say more, more so in Gaza but Israel has benefited little in terms of the increased social, social isolation and the sense of security as a result of these three, three rounds of war and yet there is a kind of psychology that it's a tough neighbourhood. If you hit hard enough, people will learn a lesson and that will keep things quiet. Well, it might absolutely temporarily. So another thing we say is you need to think about the root causes of conflict. So if you look at the Gaza war last time around, and I was in Israel at the time in 2014, I think it's probably fair to say that nobody actually had anticipated and prepared for war. But once you escalate things, and you think you might escalate things because you want to t t teach the other side a lesson, once you go down that road, war controls you, and you cannot come out until you think that you can show you're winning, until you can show your people you're winning. So both sides have to show that they're winning. Um, in fact, 
It's usually, uh, usually a terrible political fudge. But even if we look at the conditions about how one got to war there, um, certainly my understanding, it, there were, it was multifactorial, but there were, gar there were rockets being fired out of Gaza um, that w um, continued and, and continued in their intensity. And um, I think Israel thought that if it was just to show that it was firm, that that might in some way contain it. What but behind it was at the time that um, it, within the uh, Hamas administration, all the doctors and the teachers and people in the infrastructure were not being paid. And Qatar was trying to get some money into the country, and for all, a multiplicity of reasons, not least um, the split between Hamas and Fatah, and that, that, that it was illegal to get money into the country, um, as almost a, a way of saying, please pay attention to us, we'll fire some rockets. And you can see this all the time that it, in the world, that the only get the way you get the attention of the international community is if you up the stakes. And if you threaten enough, people start engaging and getting serious. So what you then got was um, a, a, the kind of round of war that created huge suffering. So now, if we think about Gaza, um, and we think in a utilitarian way, um, we, we would, one might say, what would incentivize both sides not to have another round of war? Um, now, there are, certainly in some of the conversations I've been having with people, and I'm certainly due a visit to Israel, is if there was some kind of um, regeneration of Gaza, what would that look like? And would that, I come from a psychological background, would that incentivise people to think they had something to invest in so that they were deterred from another round of war? Now, of course, this has to be very carefully negotiated because it could just, in fact, just mean um, that there were various investments and still there's another round of war. But the, there, are, there are plenty of things that could be done. Um, there's, uh, there's the whole coast, harbour, port, fishing rights airport there's a whole uh, gas there's a whole area which could involve some kind of regeneration now of course it has to be the politics have to be done and it has to be care, carefully mediated and when you think about that maybe the turks might be interested in a bit of that now what role might the russians play at the moment or how would the israeli government think about that the military might see the, the futility of another round of war but you know what's the politics of the israeli government but that's kind of what I'm talking about. What, what is it that could be done that is preparing preventatively to create the conditions to disincentivize people for another round of conflict? Um, and, and the contribution we would make in, in such situations would be about how do you help try and create, create the politics? How do you get the right cast of characters in the right, in the room? And in the end, you know, they it, if there's political lift off, it it becomes the projects of governments. And all the work we do is only to try and ripen and try and improve the conditions. Um, and it's all to do with whether time is ripe and whether the politics can be done. And maybe it's not by chance. There are serious talks going on. In Russia, at the moment, by one of my colleagues on unity, on unity talks between Hamas and Fatah, um, because of the Russian ascendancy, because of a lot of the anxieties about Trump. Um, so there's that. Um, another example I could give um, is if we think about Syria, which is the devastating war and, and an example of utter failure of well, utter failure of the international community to actually in any way make a contribution to contain things. Now, one of the things we wrote about in Fog of Peace, and the hardback version came out in 2014, and there's a chapter in it saying, do we need to be smarter? And again, it was what, at the outbreak in 2011, what could have been done to try and contain the war? Now, who knows whether it would have made any difference. And, but we actually, right at the beginning, said that the, that the Western governments should have been working more closely with Russia. Um, it was before the Ukraine 
Um, and instead of the kind of winners and losers model about which side to get behind, what would it look like if actually the position governments took was our commitment is to end the violence and to get the Syrian people round the table right at the beginning? What would that have looked like? Now, because based on the idea there's a tipping point in conflict, if you intervene too late, by then people actually want retribution. They, want, they don't want to do compromises and deals. Um, the kind of level of suffering and the human, and the human portrayal is, so, is such that people then become positioned. And so we had at least five years of Assad must go, no, he mustn't go. And behind that, you've got eight million refugees <coughs> um, and this terrible tragedy. So that was one thing that could have been done quietly, behind the scenes, off the record, many, many less public face of talks, but what could be done quietly. And diplom the, the problem is with public diplomacy is politicians are so busy flying out in and out very quickly, and it's always about what you say to the media. What really needs to happen is in-depth, quiet, behind the same, same conversations that are sustained over time and then feed into government. And this is the kind of work we say, well, we want to enlarge, but needs to be enlarged at a much, much greater scale. The other area that maybe could have made a difference is around Saudi-Iran dialogue, something that we, myself and Gianni Pico, have been involved in the last decade, seeing if there's any way that we could, in some way, help um, facilitate this. And we, in fact, had a meeting in Riyadh over a decade ago, and we've done various things off the record. But... It, it needs to be done at a higher level in terms of governments, and of course the Western governments were, were waiting for the Iran deal. Well, the question is, could we have afforded to wait? And then with the Saudis, you have to think about all the vested interests of governments in their relationship with the Saudis. So how far were they actually leaning sufficiently on both sides to get them around the table? So you're talking about the kind of proxy wars that um, now have um, actually morphed even further, and in fact, the people you need to be around the table, um, perhaps you'd, you'd have to extend who the cast of characters are. At the moment, in terms of Syria, the prime actors are Russia, Iran, and Turkey. Um, but the whole area, proxy wars, um, and you know, there certainly could be a, a role for the British government in saying they could absolutely commit saying this is our role, it's what we do, it's not actually all the money they put into Trident, it's actually we are committed to as far as possible helping prevent tipping into conflict and creating the conditions. One of the things I've written about over the last decade is the idea of standing conference tables, the idea of tables like this or semi-table, permanent tables where people are sitting around before you've tipped into conflict. But it isn't just one-offs, it's, it's just embedded as part of your system of communication.